Good morning. Welcome. On behalf of Clackamas County Children, Youth, and Families Division, can you hear me first of all? Uh, welcome. And on behalf of our partner for this event today, Clackamas County Prevention Coalition, I'm glad you all could make it. And we have some interesting speakers for you today. I hope some of you have had time to go check out the resource tables. And we're going to try to end by 1130 or so, so that we'll have a little bit more time to look at them. Um, trying really hard to bring together different disciplines of prevention work this week in honor of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, National Prevention and Mental Health Awareness Week. So that is why you are all here. We are going to start off with um, Brian and I are going to share a little bit of information about um, the, the prevention work we do at Children, Youth, and Families. We're going to turn it over to our ex executive director of local NAMI chapter to talk a little bit about mental health resources and then give the bulk of our time to Donnie Wright from Wright Counseling in West Lynn. And so just giving you kind of a, a rundown of where we're trying to go here. I do want to acknowledge Kim Hawk. She is our coalition chair for the Clackamas County Prevention Coalition. I hope you've all um, maybe picked up one of the yellow sheets on your way in. You're all invited. We love to have new and diverse opinions at our table and um, really like to, to spread our wings and hope that this event will maybe encourage you to get engaged with our coalition. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my partner, Brian McCready. He's going to talk about children, youth, and families. Good morning. I want to share a little bit today about <clears throat> some of the programs that we are directly involved with, and then uh, some of the ways that we work with our partners as well. So we'll start with a program that is really, if any of you, any of you know me and have known some of the things that I really like, and positive community norms, social norms is one of the things I'm very passionate about. <clears throat> so here's kind of a, a overview of what we share when we go to the schools with the with the youth about well, this is what social norms actually means. So they have a framework and then we will take data from the schools and do a PowerPoint presentation with them and they use these clickers where they actually vote on what they think the use of tobacco, alcohol, marijuana or other drugs is at their school. We just finished up uh, a round um, at Rex Putnam, uh, Rex Putnam High School in Milwaukee in March, and this was just one class. I just, and this isn't, this is fairly representative of the of what we found with a lot of the classes and some of, some of the things that Donnie will also uh, follow up with, and that is uh, when you look at uh, the question, which is straight off uh, the Oregon Student Wellness Survey data. Um, do you think most Rex Putnam 11th graders have used alcohol in the past 30 days? Uh, they, they think about 60% have. And then when you look at e-cigarettes, vape pens, or e-hookahs, they think like 88%. That was really shocking because actu in actuality, um, it was, oops, it was 17%. And then with the alcohol, it was 35% used in the last 30 days. And then marijuana, um, again, about 80% thought that most of the 11th graders had used marijuana in the last 30 days. So a little bit of description on how we go about doing this. We partner with Vibrant Futures Coalition uh, in North Clackamas, Safe Communities of Clackamas County, and the school district to present this program. So we start with the clickers, then we do some media literacy and talk to them about marijuana, do some marijuana education. Then we wrap up, they have an assignment that every student has to do. They have to create a poster. 
And so this is examples of some of the posters that they've created over the years. So the poster represents that positive community norm that most kids are not using drugs and alcohol. So they take that data that we share with them and then they create this poster. All right, so that's positive community norms in a nutshell. The other thing that's near and dear to my heart is teen mentor program. Teen mentor program started up in Kitsap County and it's a program where high school teens mentor elementary school students for one hour, one day a week during the school day. Uh, the program is currently going in Milwaukee um, through the district there and also out in Estacada. Here's some pictures of some of the kids. So some of the benefits of the of the teen mentor program are to build social and emotional support and as well as academic support for these elementary school students. So we train them for uh, half a day in the fall and then they go and we match them up with uh, two elementary schools out there. So Estacada High School, Clackamas River and uh, River Mill Elementaries. And so they meet once a week do fun stuff, bond, and uh, we're going to do a trip to the zoo here in a few weeks uh, with all of them. All right, and then lastly, which this program has been kind of a, a mainstay of, of what we've been about over the last, I'd say, eight, nine years, PreventNet. And how many of you have heard of PreventNet in the, in the, in the audience? Okay, yes. Okay, so you're looking at some pictures from fun activities that that have occurred with PreventNet. And we are funded through Youth Development Council of Oregon, and then we contract out with Todos Suntos and Northwest Family Services. Tiffany uh, oversees the rural with Todos Suntos, and I oversee the Northwest Family Services contracts. So here's just some pictures of, of some of the fun things some of the kids have done. Um, they have a, they had a, at Gardner, they had a, uh, day of, of career exploration. So some of the things that are focused with PreventNet are to improve academic performance and reduce risky behaviors. So academic performance is the key piece of, of the PreventNet program. Each site, they have 30 core youth that they work with uh, on a regular basis. Um, staff refer students to community resources. That's why it's so important that we really emphasize with our PreventNet program to reach out to community resources because really there's a lot of resources out there that we can connect them to that can be of little or no cost to the students and their families to help them be successful. Uh, receive homework assistance, usually that's uh, during or sometimes after school, and participate in extracurricular activities. So here's some of those extracurricular activities that you're looking at. These are the sites, current sites for this year of PreventNet. So uh, New Urban High School is a new site in Milwaukee and Molly Martinez uh, oversees that site as well as Milwaukee High School. And then we're at uh, Rao, Alder Creek, Cracksburger and Gladstone Gardner in Oregon City. And then the rural Baker Prairie, Malala, Estacada and Cedar Ridge. So afterwards, if you have any questions about any of these programs, you can talk to me or we're going to have time to go out to the tables and uh, give you some time to peruse. So do you have anything else, Tiffany? Thank you. Yeah, so PreventNet actually has a table out here in our lobby. I'm happy to have Eric here from Todos Suntos and several people here representing Northwest Family Services who actually work with our providers um, and work in the schools are there ones on the front line actually in the trenches doing the work and actually making a difference in um, reducing risk factors and in promoting um, protective factors for our youth and helping them bond to school in a way that um, engages them and helps them academically and um, throughout their life. So um, PreventNet staff just give me a little wave. Thank you for all that you do. We really appreciate you. I, I wanted to add one more program to something that we have coming out of our office this 
year at, that is the school resource, resource coordinator position. Um, it's brand new this year and um, we have somebody who's very experienced, a CADC3, who is going around to the schools and is available at, primarily at the PreventNet sites to do drug and alcohol assessments and refer students and families to appropriate services. So we're hoping over the years to be able to expand that a little bit, but Right now, we're um, getting out there as much as we can and trying to engage the schools in that service. Um, so that's kind of what we do at a few of the things that we do at Children, Youth, and Families for Prevention. Um, please visit the PreventNet table. Also, I staff the Children, um, Clackamas County Prevention Coalition that I mentioned, and there's a table out there. Please come and visit me out there. With that, I'm going to go ahead and um, invite Michelle to talk a little bit about the resources for mental health in Clackamas County. Please help me welcome Michelle Vinker. Hello. I'm going to try to go. I've got a pretty loud voice without the microphone. If you can't hear, nope. Okay, well then I will use the microphone. <laughs> Okay, um, so my name is Michelle and I'm the Executive Director for NAMI Clackamas County. Um, for those of you who do not know about us, we provide support, education, advocacy, and outreach for people who have been impacted by mental health across the spectrum. So that is people who have experienced mental health issues themselves, as well as family members, loved ones, and community members. Because whether you know it or not, we've all been impacted. Uh, one, about 20% of people have a diagnosis mental health uh, condition in every given year. So if it's not you, it's probably your neighbor, a family member, someone you work with, someone you go to church with, um, and we don't always talk about it. So that is our job. Um, I became involved because I have uh, family members, children, who have dealt with either um, substance abuse or mental health issues, and most commonly both of them. And when my daughter was falling through the cracks and we were not able to find the help that she needed, um, I turned to NAMI who helped me navigate a system um, and advocate for her, which was the most important thing. And currently uh, she lives in independent housing and um, is doing the best she can considering she's got a severe and persistent mental health issue, as well as, with many people with mental health issues, um, comorbid things, including epilepsy and, by, and uh, MS. Um, so, but she's still living independently. So I'm going to go over a couple of things first before I go into resources. If you already know some of this, please just bear with me. But uh, we have a lot of misconceptions about what mental health actually is. And it's and, and when it starts. So it's a spectrum um, disorder. So I think all of us could probably identify at times when we were really excited and almost jumping out of our skin about something that was coming up or something that we were doing. Um, or we all probably had times when maybe we lost a family member or a pet or something else and we felt really depressed. Now if you expand that and it lasts for considerably longer than it would for a normal person, you can't deal with it yourself or it impacts your thinking, ability to re relate to other going to work, going to school, that's when it becomes a mental health disorder. So just think of those things we've experienced and just take them one step further. So I think we can almost all um, somehow relate to what people with mental health disorders are going through. They're biologically based. Um, that being said, we do know that they're biosocial psycho or biopsychosocial. There is usually a combination of things that are working in someone coming up with a mental health disorder. Um, there's usually something biological, whether that happens to be um, genetic, and they're talking about maybe multiple genetic uh, pieces. Um, it can also be triggered by something physical that's going on. That could be abuse um, or other uh, abuse. It could be a, another, um, somebody who has a chronic illness often deals with depression or other things. Or it could be something social. Um, again, uh, uh, abuse, uh, having problems making friends, low self-esteem. Likewise, it also, treatment comes in many different forms. Some people react best to uh, something that's physical, like a, a pill or a prescription. Other people react best to something that um, is psychological, like, like um, talk therapy or dialectical behavior therapy. And other people re react best to, to just being able to get out and create those social connections within their community. Most often it's a combination, because it is a combination thing that's happening. Um, they 
follow along a continuum of severity. And one thing that we really try to express, especially to the folks who are experiencing it in the self, is it's not a lack of character. It's not a just pick yourself up by the bootstraps and, and get better. People who are experiencing it, just like you can't tell somebody, fix your broken leg, will ya? You can't tell them, please get over your mental health issues. What was really interesting that came out, um, there was a survey of 4,200 uh, students in Oregon, and they were asked a variety of questions, including about teachers, about curriculum, about and mental health conditions, and being able to get mental health help was the number one thing that came out of that survey. So it is impacting our youth in a big way. Suicide is also a big thing. So 20% of our our youth, age 13 to 18, live with a mental health condition. Um, you have on some infographics on your chair, at least most of you do, it says on there that it's the third leading cause of death among our, our young people. It is actually now the second leading cause of death. Um, I'm going to cheat and, and look on here. Uh, more teenagers and young adults die from suicide than cancer, heart disease, AIDS, birth defects, stroke, pneumonia, influenza, and chronic lung disease combined. It's a real issue. And about five of our suicides here in Clackamas County are youth every year. Why? Why are our are, are youth um, attempting suicide? Why are we having problems with mental health issues? There's an average of eight to 10 years between the time a person first has a mental health issue or, or has symptoms and when they first get help. And a lot of that has to do with stigma. It's how we feel about it. People say they don't want to be friends with someone with a mental health issue. They don't want to work with someone with a mental health issue. They may already be, but when they're asked outright, there's a, still a lot of stigma and a lot of it's internal. Um, I have seen people say, I'm not crazy. But we've got to get past that, that it's not crazy, past that language, that this is something um, that is, uh, again, biological and we can deal with it. And what is even more important is recovery as possible. Most people, given the right tools, will recover and go on to lead the kind of life that they always intended to. So why NAMI? Why should we be concerned about NAMI? We, our mission is to provide um, Ah, now I'm going to provide uh, support, education, and outreach um, for people who have been impacted by mental health issues. So again, that is people who um, have, are family members, people who are neighbors and friends. That is people who are impacted and, and deal with those uh, symptoms themselves. Um, I'm really excited about the vision that we came up a few uh, years ago, and that's because we had people who themselves identified as having mental health issues that helped us with it. I first, I thought vision. There's no mental health. There's a cure. We don't have to deal with it anymore, um, whatever that looks like. And it was surprising to me that our folks said, no, we don't want that. Because their mental health issues, what's made them the person they are, that made them stronger and empathetic and so many other things. But they did want hope, health, acceptance, and community. That's the important part. They wanted community. They wanted to know that they were accepted for who they were, how they were. So some of those resources that I was asked to talk about. Ending the Silence. This is a program where we, and we're just expanding it. We started out with students. Has anybody here seen an Ending the Silence presentation? Okay, so we go into schools and we talk about what are the signs and symptoms of mental health issues? What do you do if you know somebody? We talk openly about suicide, but the clincher there is we bring in somebody who had symptoms, a young person who had symptoms while they were in school, who tell about their story and their journey and offer a glimpse of hope. We now are just expanding it to include school staff and families. And I am going to now show you just a clip of one of the videos. What's also exciting to me about this is that it's got several video uh, clips in it, and they were all done by high school students. Their words, their acting. This was the first day we met. I knew right away that you were going to be a big part of my life. We had so many good times. But this was the day you started acting different. You isolated yourself. You were sad all the time. I thought you were ignoring me, but... When I saw your wrists, I knew it was much more than that. I knew I had to talk to an adult so you could get the help that you needed.
And today is the day we appreciate the life that could have been lost. Not every friendship has a tomorrow. If someone you know is showing signs of suicide, talk to an adult or call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline because suicide can be prevented. So in addition to us doing that, you have also on your desk a little card, and we give that card to each of the students so that they have resources and they have the symptoms handy. We ask them to put them in their wallets. Of course, some of them don't, but a lot of them do. Our next resource is NAMI Basics, and NAMI Basics is a class for parents or primary caregivers of children and adolescents who have symptoms of mental health issues. Again, there is no boundaries for that, so they don't have to be diagnosed, they don't have to have health care, they don't have to have an income limit. They're anybody who identifies as, I have a child who even I think might have mental health issues. And it's taught by other parents, so they're people who have been there. There's Talk It Over support groups, and at my um, desk, you'll, or my, my table, you'll get flyers for that. Um, those happen twice a month, and those are for parents, again, who identify as either having a child with a mental health issue or a behavioral health issue, because I know with my case and in many others, we don't want to believe there's a mental health thing going on right away, but we do know there might be something behavioral going on. So this covers both of them. We have a gal in our office who is a young adult um, who has a bipolar disorder, and I'm able to share this to her with you because that's part of what she does. She talks to family members. She talks to people who identify. She can talk to youth on what it's been like for her, as well as help them find resources in our community. We have a library with a full range of topics, including a book on how to talk to kids if the parent has a mental health issue. We know it's genetic, we know we need to look at it, but we also need to prepare our kids um, for some of the stresses they may find. Some that is not ours, but I want to bring out to you, is if you don't know about it, Youth New Era and the Drop in Milwaukee is a free drop-in group that helps kids um, who identify as needing help. They don't have to be mental health issues, but they're at-risk kids or kids that just want uh, some, a little bit extra help, um, and it's a drop. Oregon Family Support Work Network offers, um, and, and theirs is a little bit more restricted. So the drop is for anybody. There's, there's no barriers there. Um, they're actually right now only for folks who have kiddos that are in services with Clackamas County at a pretty high level. But they do provide wraparound services and help uh, parents navigate the system. ESA is one I want to talk to. LifeWorks operates ESA, which is an early assessment for Kiddos who are experiencing early psychotic, so the first or maybe second psychotic issue, it again is really exciting because not only does it provide some great wraparound services, but it is again no barrier. So it doesn't matter what insurance, it doesn't matter income. Uh, the living room provides a safe pace for those kid kiddos who identify as LGBTQ. We know that in itself is not a mental health issue, but because of the, those kids being um, ostracized or marginalized, a higher percentage of them, sometimes kicked out of their homes when they come out, um, do uh, experience mental health problems. Riverstone is uh, something offered by Clackamas County, and it's available um, to kiddos at 14. You can start getting treatment without your parents' knowledge or family members who need some, some more information. It's a great crisis walk-in center, open a lot of hours, and also offer, operates out of there our uh, local crisis line. And something I always thought was interesting with Riverstone, they identify, they describe crisis as anything that the person experience it describes as crisis. So I may say suicidality means a crisis. Someone else may say, my dog died, and that's my crisis. So they, they will do, go with whatever you identify as a crisis when you talk to them. And then I want to quickly talk about opportunities. The ability to share it forward, because that was part of my therapy so that I could deal with mine. I'm really excited about basics. I talked about that program. We are bringing, or NAMI Oregon is bringing, the creator of that class to teach parents how to help other parents. And we're looking for folks who had a child, have or had a child that at 13 or younger um, experienced their first symptoms. So I've got applications again at my table. If you know somebody who would help pay it forward, if it helped them or uh, if they'd like to help someone else do that. We're always looking um, for ending the science presenters and something that you might be able to do is help us connect with youth groups, uh, parent groups, schools, other relevant organizations for ending the silence or other programs. Our NAMI walk is coming. Um, 
We'd love to see all of you there. It is the largest anti-stigma event in Clackamas County. Uh, Health, Housing, and Human Services has a team, so you could join up and, and walk with them for Clackamas County. Uh, and our jail, um, Sheriff's Department, also has a team, and they're in a little bit of a competition. So there will be a lot of people there, 6,000 people last year. So we are standing up and saying that nobody should be doing this alone, and we should be able to be open and talk about it. And the most important thing you can do is tell somebody in need about NAMI Clackamas. Thank you. Ex Are you there? Excellent, Michelle. Thank you so much for sharing those really important resources. I think that these are things that we can all engage in the programs that we are involved in, that you all represent. And we're going to move right on to um, Donnie Wright. We've given him the bulk of our time. Brian and I sought him out because we really see him as um, having the, the pulse of youth and addiction in Clackamas County. So while we, Brian and I, and many of you study drug and alcohol prevention and trends um, all the time, Donnie is the one who's actually meeting with kids and seeing what happens and following kind of where they're at right here, right now in our county. And so we wanted to bring him in to um, share. He's He's um, open to questions, I think, and I will just turn it over to you. Thanks for being here, Donnie. And we're going to go till about 11.30 um, so that you have some time at the tables outside. Can you hear me? <clears throat> is, that, is that coming through? I'll, I'll project a little bit. Um, I do prefer much more interaction, if we can. Uh, I think that uh, I, well, let me ask this. Why are you here? You're here as a professional, you here, why, why are you here? Somebody raise their hand or somebody tell me, why are you here? Boss made you come, what? Pretty much, boss sent it, everybody, okay, so we got a bunch of employees here today. Um, I've, I, uh, I've been doing drug and alcohol as well as mental health addictions um, services since 1999. I moved here in 99 and uh, for many years was the primary therapist for the juvenile drug court program here in Clackamas County. My slideshow is really more to keep me honest and to throw some concepts up there. I would really like to, again, ask, answer questions and things like that. These are some of the things, um, when I was invited to do this, you know, being prevention week, some of the things that we really should consider, whether you're an employee, a parent, or a friend, or anything else, you have to pay attention to what you're role modeling, because what you're role modeling is gonna depend on your credibility when you're starting to answer questions or respond to other individuals. If you're not credible, then any information coming out of your mouth is going to be absolutely useless and it's just going to elicit a defensive response. If you're really looking to impact kiddos or anybody else, does anybody in here not know what the collaborative problem solving process is? If you don't know what it is, look it up. It's a very systemic approach to try to engage somebody in a dialogue and a discussion to move towards a solution that both of you can identify as to what some possible roadmaps to that are. That's a great process, not only in prevention work, counseling work, I think it works really well systemically. It's basically a joining process that helps you move through, come up with brainstorms and all that kinds of stuff. If you are ever gonna to talk to somebody about drugs and alcohol, you have to have the facts accurate. If you don't have the facts accurate, again, those individuals are going to look at you like you have no credibility. If it isn't a fact, make sure you express it as an opinion, and they know it's your opinion. Because that will continue to maintain your credibility and still allow you to express to somebody, this is simply my opinion. I can't totally back this up with fact. I'm concerned about this because of this. Um, so if you are going to make it an opinion, make sure that that is absolutely clear. Talk. We have to be talking. We have to be talking as a culture. We have to be talking as parents. We have to be talking as professionals. We have to be talking, but almost more importantly, you need to be listening. Because if you listen, then you know better what you need to be talking about. If you're going in from a prevention point of view or a substance abuse point of view or even a mental health issue, you come in with a doctor-patient mentality of I'm going to tell you what's what without even listening to the other individual, 
you're going to miss the mark, and they are not going to join you in the process. Something that is also very, very helpful in the world of prevention work with addictions and mental health, as Michelle already mentioned. Tell, if you've got a story, share it. Share it. If you don't have the courage to share your story, don't do that. That's fine. But one of the things that really helps people out is that if they understand or believe you walk some of the walk, and you have some of your own personal reality that you bring to whatever it is you're trying to impact somebody on. In your discussions, you, sh you need to know your goal. There can be lots of goals. What am I trying to accomplish? Um, I'm just going to throw all these right out. Am I trying to accomplish policy change? Am I trying to help somebody identify resources? Motivational interviewing is another very, very systemic approach to how you move somebody through the stages of change. If I'm trying to impact somebody, if somebody, I, I work with a lot of adolescent kiddos, right? And, and the majority of them don't believe that marijuana is a problem, let alone that it's a problem for them. And so that would be what they're in basically what's considered a pre-contemplative stage of change. They're not even thinking about changing. If I come in to them and I start to tell them how to make changes because their parents want them to make changes, that kiddo is not going to change. I've got to create some ambivalence in their mind i got to move them to a direction where they're even considering the possibility of making some changes. So in my communication is my goal to move them through the, through the stages of change. Maybe they're already ready to change. My heroin addicts, my methamphetamine addicts, they want to change. They don't like it. They're in pain. And so then I'm not trying to motivate them. In my dialogue with them, I'm trying to help them set up a plan as to how they can go about those changes. You know, are there thoughts that they can do differently? Can they set structure up differently? Are there behaviors they could be doing differently? What is my goal? Is my goal simply information dissemination? I have somebody come in and they just want, I have, um, yesterday I was meeting with a, an eighth grader and I actually had just uh, had on my computer screen up, I had, I had a slide that you'll see later and the, the head is just says cannabis. This is the second time I've met this kiddo. Mom and dad um, contacted me and sent him to me, basically because the family's got a history of depression, uh, anxiety, some more severe uh, mental health issues that run on both sides of the family. The kiddo has started to isolate, right? That was one of the warning signs that was identified. And they want to get him in to get some help just to see what's what. I'm still trying to build rapport with him, so he sees this word cannabis up on my screen, and I hadn't filled in any of the stuff below it, and he looks at it, and he just lights up. He's like, you've got weed on your computer. I'm like, I do. You want to talk about it? And he's, like, and, he, and he's like, sure. I'm like, what do you know about it? What do you know about weed? He's like, I, I don't know. I know it's not addictive. You know who told him that? No, his health teacher. Schools are still disseminating inaccurate information. I had a 22-year-old kiddo that I've known since he was um, about 16. Uh, he's been in and out of my world a little bit. Recently re-engaged with me because their insurance kicked in and they can use me a little bit better now. But he got a DUI about almost a year ago. And so I've been seeing him twice a week. And, and I, I had a great opportunity to just start to blast him with questions. You know, what would have changed? What impacted you? How much did your family play a role in this stuff? How much did school help and all this other things? And he said something else that was really disappointing to me about another health teacher. He says, you know, when they don't teach you anything in school, one, that's accurate. Two, the timing doesn't seem to fit. You know, we do prevention work, um, but when we're little, and drugs and alcohol aren't even really on my mind, so I'm not even really listening. And then by the time I get into high school, I'm already interested in it and doing it, so I'm not listening to the teacher. And then he said, my teacher even said, they're making me talk about this, which shut me down in the classroom. I'm like, dang, that's not good. And I'm not trying to bash teachers. I love teachers. I, I um, work with a couple of them as well, and I think being a teacher is, a, is an amazing gift to community. I want to talk about, I do not have statistics on this. This is simply anecdotal and what I've been seeing in my office on the ground for the last, I'll go 16 months. This jewel thing is an epidemic. 
Does anybody not know what a jewel is? Oh, Google the jewel. Um, it's, a little, it's a little smoking device. It's a small vaping device that um, a lot of parents and, and adults are misreading as a USB port device. It's, it's straight nicotine. When I, I, I get invited to go different, to do different kind of talks in uh, Lake Ridge Junior High, loves to have me come out. Okay, I got a couple teachers out there. They love to have me come out and talk. And basically my prevention approach with them is they want me to talk about my story. I'm an addict and an alcoholic. So I go in there and I talk to the kiddos about this is what my story is. And I try to teach them things through my own story. And the last time I went out, this was, uh, I think, in March. And uh, so I'm out there and I, I say to the kiddos, I said, you're in the classroom, so I don't want you to raise your hand. But how many of you have a jewel? And about 50% of the class looks down at the floor. I, and I said to them, I said, now, you can raise your hand on this one. How many of you know somebody that has a jewel? 100% of the kids raised their hand. I asked this kiddo that lit up on the cannabis you know, slide for me yesterday. I said, you know, tell me what you're seeing about the jewel. He said something interesting. He says, it seems like it's going out of a trend. Um, he said, in January, it seemed like 100 kiddos in my class had jewels. Right now, it seems to have dropped off down to about 20. I asked him, I said, why do you think this is happening? Why, why, let me ask you guys this. I've, I've got a little bit of a theory. Why would a vaping nicotine product be taking over everywhere? And I'm not, I'm not talking just Clackamas County. I have kiddos and other individuals that are coming from multiple counties, downtown Portland, Washington County. Vancouver, and about 12, 12 to 14 months ago, everybody started to talk about this jewel thing. Why do you guys think it's just sweeping through our adolescent population? Anybody got an idea? Yeah, it can be hidden. My, my belief is, is one of the quintessential adolescent greatest craving desires is to fly under the radar of adults. Oh, I'm getting away with this, and you don't even know it, right? And so it feeds right into that, and it's easy to hide. You know, and I asked this kid, I said, why do you think so much of this is happening? He says, everybody wants to fit in. And it goes back to that perception thing that Brian threw up. Their perception is everybody's doing it. One of my clients, she is such bad luck. She gets caught the first time she does everything. She got... She got busted. She, no, she does. She really does. She comes in. She's like, ah, I got caught. And, and she's, re she's really genuine. She's like, this is the first time I ever did this. We went to McDonald's to get some ice cream at 2 o'clock in the morning with a friend, and she gets caught. She, she, um, they, last Friday, she goes into the bathroom with a couple other friends, and they're vaping. She tries it for the first time. She thinks it's disgusting, doesn't want to do it. And then right as that's coming to her insight, the teacher walks in. She gets busted, right? You know, I asked her, I said, why'd you do it? She said, I was curious. Everybody's doing it. You know, it's this concept of fitting in, flying under the radar. I have one client, he was vaping in the common area at West Lynn, and the principal walks up behind him and puts a hand on his shoulder, says, come with me. And he looks at her, at the principal, and he says, no, I didn't do anything. You can't prove it. And he had quickly handed the jewel off, there's no smell, there's no nothing, and so he's going to go with the lawyer approach if you got no proof. The principal is like, I don't need proof, come with me, right? You know, so th this thing is sweeping through, and then the scary part is, is that the kid's knowledge and awareness of it is, is a little distorted. It's like, well, it's not cigarettes. There's bad stuff in cigarettes. We've done a great job at educating the next generation around cigarettes. We haven't done such a good job around this concept of just nicotine, period. Um, so they don't think there's anything problematic with it. Um, I asked, the, you know, and, and some of that's valid. That's the problem. Some of it's valid. Um, you know, so I, my, I try to motivate them. Well, you know, what do you think it would be like to have to be foot? It's like, how much is a jewel? And this is the other thing that fascinates me. Um, I've got clients that are selling and distributing jewels and jewel pots for a job. One client says, why would I go to work at Burger King 
when in a six-hour shift, I'm going to make less than if I can sit at home or just take to school five jewel pods and five jewels, and I can make twice as much money. So these kids are buying them in bulk. One kiddo ordering them through Amazon and having them mailed to a friend's house, right? And so, I mean, literally, where there's a will, there's a way. I got clients that are driving up to Washington to get them because the laws are different up there. And I don't have to be 21 yet up there. Our 21 laws are making it really difficult for these kiddos um, to get nicotine at the same level. And so then they're redistributing them. And it's actually, it, that's the level of what this stuff is turned into. So it's going to be really interesting to see, is this a fad like, say, tongue piercings, where I remember like 15 years ago, all my clients were getting tongue piercings. It's like, what happened to that? I don't see so many of those anymore. You know, it's, what's going to happen with this jewel stuff? And the sad thing is, again, they're walking right into a nicotine addiction. And they're literally fiending. They're getting hooked on a substance that they believe is safe and free. And then they're finding out, oh my gosh, I've got a nicotine addiction and I'm hooked on it and the amount of money and the time that they're investing in it. There's an interesting thing out, one of the way the schools and some uh, parents are trying to scare the kids away from this is a concept called popcorn lung. This was fascinating. I looked this up. Does anybody have any idea what popcorn lung is? What, what, what's popcorn lung? The answer, what she stated is um, it's a type of cancer you can get from microwave popcorn. Really, really close. Um, back in the 80s, there were people in popcorn, microwave popcorn factories that were dying. They're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? So they started to take a look at it. There's a, a, a chemical that was being applied to microwave popcorn and some other food products that these employees were inhaling. And it was causing lung issues, cancers, and things like that, and eventually killing them. So the term popcorn lung came up. Most of the vaping juice, which is what it's called, you know, the flavored juice, even if it doesn't have nicotine in it, most of them have that chemical in it or a similar chemical. And so a lot of schools and parents are saying, you could get popcorn lung, you, you know, as a way of trying to scare, to scare the kids you know, and or bring a reality of, look, this isn't as safe as you think it is. And we don't have the research as long term what this stuff is going to do. This one scares the crap out of me. Excuse my language. I know I'm being recorded. I told myself I wasn't going to swear. Benzodiazepines, Xanax, Valium, Lorazepam. These are old school medications that were designed to shut down panic attacks. They're highly addictive. Um, it used to be that you could only get pills that were up to two milligrams now on the street. And I don't know if the pharmaceuticals have created a larger dose or if people are printing these things and distributing them themselves. But you can now get what they're calling green hulks, and that's three milligrams. That is massive doses. And so I have seen more benzodiazepine reports in my office in the last year than I've seen in the 20 years of my history of doing this. I don't know why. I don't know if it's the counterbalance to the rise of anxiety in our culture, because I'm seeing a ton of anxiety and a ton of depression referrals are coming my way. And I don't know if people are seeking these out. I don't know if the black market, people have just figured out, okay, we're just going to flood this stuff in there. I don't know if people are pulling them out of uh, cupboards and doctors are prescribing it at a higher level, I don't know. But what I do know is that benzodiazepines are here and the kids are abusing the, the tar out of them. I caught myself that time. Um, those, those are scary things. There's only two drugs that have a high probability of killing you in withdrawal. Alcohol and benzodiazepines. Um, I've watched some really sad situations. One kiddo, he came in. I was working with him for a while. He moved. Um, but he was, he was chewing down upwards of 12 to 16 milligrams of benzodiazepines. That's pretty much almost a lethal dose right there. And he was drinking on top of it. His suicide risk skyrocketed. We were just trying to keep him alive. 
and trying to help him get off that stuff without dying through withdrawal. Um, but he had ready and easy access. Again, I don't know if these are coming from our pharmaceutical companies or if they're pulling it off the web. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Silk Road. The Silk Road is you can get into the dark web. The Silk Road is you can order anything you want. It'll be mailed right to you. Feds came in, shut that down. I think they threw the original creator of it in jail for about 15 life, or I think it was 150 life sentences. I mean, it was a crazy amount of time. Within six hours, it was back up and running with somebody else leading it. So I don't know, and I have kids tell me all the time, they're ordering acid, they're ordering cocaine. They're ordering these party drugs straight off the web and having it delivered right to their home. So again, I don't know where the benzos are coming from, but they are here. Some of the other medication abuse that we've seen, this stuff hasn't changed a lot. Most of the medication abuse, when you're talking about not pain meds, but when you're talking about the ADHD meds or cold and cough medicine, tends to be within the middle school range. That's where the kids are starting to experiment with taking a bunch of coracetin or robitussin or other things like that to get a little bit of a head change. Inhalants also tend to be at that middle school range. The scary thing is, is this seems to be dropping down into elementary school. I'm hearing more and more about the ages of these behaviors and these risk factors dropping about a year or two previous to what they t used to be in my practice, you know, 10 years ago. Um, which is, which is obviously is concerning. I think a lot of that's probably media and exposure. Kids are getting introduced or they have access to see things at a much younger age, a much direct, uh, more direct and visual and all that other kinds of stuff. Um, the pain meds, those are the classics going into the cupboard. Somebody or somebody gets injured or otherwise, they start to really enjoy the euphoria that the pain meds um, provide them and then they just kind of snowball. Hallucinogens, I'm hearing a fair amount of hallucinogens in high school right now. I'm hearing more about LSD than I have in a long time. Um, and so, again, I don't know if somebody, we've got more chemists in the U.S. that are creating that stuff. It does tend to come through the college routes uh, and things like that. But I think you can say, out of, I'd say 50% of the seniors that I'm currently working with um, this year have all, at least 50% have done hallucinogens. Seems to be more LSD than mushrooms. Um, I'm not seeing as much of what I thought was going to be a wave of the synthetic hallucinogens. Um, there are tryptamines. About 10 years ago, those were starting to be pretty popular. I haven't seen them really stick around very much. It seems like people are going back to the old school clean drugs, right? Um, and so I am seeing a fair amount of hallucinogen use in high school, typically seniors. Uh, and I am hearing a lot of cocaine in the early 20s. A lot of my early 20-year-old kiddos, um, they're still kiddos to me, I guess I'm getting old. Um, I'm hearing a lot more about cocaine and the kids getting hooked on it. I got three clients right now in their early 20s that they're struggling from separating and individuating. They're separate, they're having a hard time becoming independent, fully independent. And I got three of them that are hooked on the cocaine alcohol wheel. Um, the one of these clients um, came into my office Last Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock, he reeked of alcohol. He had already started drinking, and he's depressed. And I asked him, what's his day going to look like? He's real, he was really depressed and bummed out because he had two deaths in his life that week. His, his partner in his cocaine dealing process killed himself. And one of his um, skateboarding heroes uh, died of an overdose. Later that day, I don't know if you guys know about Skate Church downtown. It's a kind of a skate culture church, right? And they were having a funeral service for this dude. I was trying to motivate my client, go to the service. You need, you need to go to a service. You need to go experience the rite of passage. It helps with the healing. And so when he's leaving the office about five minutes before, I said, what are you going to do today? He says, well, I'm going to go buy some more beer, and I'm going to probably, um, well, I'm going I'm to get some more cocaine. Right? And I haven't seen him since last week. Uh, he kind of comes in and out of my world episodically. I don't, I don't, I'm sure that's what he did. I don't know if he got to the funeral or not. But I'm seeing a, a more of the cocaine stuff. And I don't know if it's that's because the prices have dropped or like this kiddo, they're just getting into the industry and so they're distributing so they can keep using their stuff. 
Um, but I am hearing more about cocaine. I haven't seen as many methamphetamine clients over the last couple of years. 10, 15 years ago, that was really sweeping through everything. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of that. What that could also be, though, is just anecdotally from where I sit in my world. I'm in a private practice. Most drug and alcohol stuff is going to funnel through agencies. Um, so I do wonder what some of the, you know, whether it's, it's the county agency here or LifeWorks or DePaul or things like that, I do wonder what level they're seeing stuff in comparisons to treating, say, marijuana addiction or some of the higher stuff. Um, but I, I am hearing more about cocaine than I am methamphetamine. Heroin, um, it's, it's alive, it's well. It is very active in our communities. Uh, some of that stuff, it's the typical progression starts with medications, ends up at a cheaper substance um, that they can continue to get high with. Um, <clears throat> again, I think just because I'm in private practice, most of those higher level clients, I think are ending up in agencies where they're able to access much more frequent uh, level of services. So I don't know if you know the level of services in Oregon, but level two, there's four levels, one, two, three, four. Four is hospitalization, your rights taken away. Three is rehab. Level two is intensive outpatient. For adolescents, that's six hours to nine hours of therapy a week, right? Most of that's done in groups. I just don't have the time to do that. So I do wonder if some of these higher level substances are being treated in uh, the agencies. The commercialization of cannabis has been fascinating, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I'm seeing a ton of anxiety and depression. But uh, just before um, uh, the, all of this started, I, I looked at my calendar and took a look at my week. I, I, I'm, I'm crazy busy. I do, on average, 35 to 40 hours of direct service a week. Most clinicians are averaging about 25, 26. So I looked at my, my schedule and just kind of scanned through of which ones were addictions and which ones were other stuff. 85 to 90% of my clients this week are anxiety and depression. Kiddos to adults to everything. And some of it is situational. Much of it is, um, I think, the organic, long-term kinds of things. Um, but there is a, a massive increase. In my practice, in my world, I get a lot of referrals for these middle school and high school kiddos that are experiencing some massive anxiety. I'm talking panic attacks that are firing off three to six times a day and the panic attacks lasting anywhere from five minutes to two hours. That's crazy. That, 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 that's, just, that's just nuts. So this is what you saw, cannabis. Um, and I apologize for the weird, I don't know, that just pulled from an old slide and this is how I had it all set up, so. Potency, back in the, yes. I'm in a school and I see that too. Yeah. Um, and I just am curious anecdotally, why do you think such an uptick? I, I think it's the pressure and the speed of life. So one of the things that I love to talk about is the marshmallow study. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. I can't remember if it's Harvard or State, some credible university marshmallow study. You take little kiddos. If you don't eat the marshmallow, you get another one. It's essentially about delaying gratification. These kids have no idea what that is. I want to know something about Uganda. I can pull it up right now. And our cultural and societal pressures that they do that quickly and immediately is live and well and real. And so these kids, I think, are feeling a ton of pressure. They haven't learned to delay gratification. And in learning to delay gratification, you develop skills and emotional tolerance, and you develop these these real processes that help us manage the craziness of our worlds and the pressure around us. They're not being taught that naturally and logically. I get down so much to the basic level that when parents tell me, you know, my kid's impulsive, they do all this, and I explain this to them, and I said, you know, next time he asks you a question, just make him wait 30 seconds. Just look at them. They'll think you're nuts, but they already think you're nuts. But even in that 30 seconds, that kid has got to figure out, what is this? <laughs> you know, And these natural, logical ways of how do I help them reduce or increase their, their tolerance for distress. And so I think it's the massive and rapid that's causing a lot of that in the, in the visual stuff. We got two questions. Test, test, test. Okay. Hey, um, yeah, I, uh, I was just curious if uh, you can maybe share with us how uh, you 
integrate like trauma informed practice into your work? Because it sounds like a lot of the things that you're talking about, for me as a violence prevention uh, educator, those all sound like symptoms of trauma. Yeah. And and so um, I'm wondering how you sort of address that in the work that you do with uh, with with youth. Uh, it's especially now I got to be quieter, more loud. Um, especially with females, that's almost always um, an absolute question that's asked in the very first meeting I have with them, even if I don't have the rapport. And I, I'll phrase it as trauma, and I won't, I won't give them a definition for it. I'll just simply ask them, you know, do you believe you've ever experienced some trauma or have there been any traumatic events in your life? And if they say no, or I, if they say no, my, I'm, see, I'm, I'm a smart aleck. I say, how do you know? <laughs> Prove it to me. I say the same thing when somebody walks in my office and they say, I'm having a good day. I was like, how do you know? <laughs> I, I just drive people nuts. Um, but, you know, and so there's some of that. There's also, um, I work with several individuals that do have some pretty significant trauma, everything from violent sexual assaults to car accidents. And so that process is, is either coping strategies, identifying it, reframing, um, there's all different kinds of things that can be done in the therapeutic session as well as some of the cognitive behavioral stuff around how do we reduce exposure to these symptoms, how do you cope with them. Uh, sometimes it's uh, also referrals out to uh, prescribers or things like that if the anxiety or the depression is bad enough. And so it is very much absolutely on my lens. One of the um, things that the, uh, an individual who uh, was in a car accident, we, I've been working with her almost a, a year and a half now. She still has panic attacks and everything. I handed her a brochure for a yoga workshop a couple of weeks ago that was designed specifically just for trauma work. And so looking for resources out there, having it on the mindset, and ask, having the courage to ask the question. I ask the boys the same thing, and I make them prove it as well. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. In my, in my office, well, you wouldn't be aware of this part. In my office, I have a guitar. And on my guitar, one of the strings is blue. It's a campaign that's it's one in six. And blue guitar strings are, are disseminated or given out because one in six males are sexually assaulted in a lifetime. Most people think that's, no, no. I mean, we talk about female sexual assault all the time. Well, maybe not all the time. You know, we talk about the statistics on that and being about one in four, but most people are not aware. One in six males in a lifetime are sexually assaulted. You know, so it, having the courage to talk about it, having the courage to ask the questions is really how, how I'm trying to incorporate it. And a lot, of, um, a lot of the trauma work too, I really, really believe in the physical components of things. And so I'm trying to motivate people towards exercise, towards mindfulness, towards eating well, to sleeping and all those kinds of things. I must have asked at least 30 people this month if they'll join me in a half marathon um, that, that I'm doing at the end of the next month, so. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I, I ramble. I just want to touch bases with your question about why we're seeing more anxiety and depression. I agree with you. A lot of it is the pace and, and, and those things, the pressures on our kids. But also, a lot of it is identification. Now we're learning to identify this may not be a behavioral issue. It may not be, um, including drug and alcohol use, may not be just that. There might be something else going on in the kiddo's life. Um, and as well as as we're getting to talk about it more, as we're loosening the stigma, where these kids are able to come out now and say, this is what's going on in my life. This is why, I, so it's, again, it's a lot of it is identification um, and, and the lack, uh, the reduction of, of stigma and being able to talk about it in a school setting or with a therapist or someone. Yeah, I agree. I, I've, I've been hearing more kiddos will come in and they'll, they'll, they'll label it. I have anxiety or I have depression, um, which it didn't used to get quite as much in the past. It. Yeah, um, my question is about um, the ADHD medicine and college kids taking it to, um, you know, be able to, to concentrate more yeah. on their homework. It, have you seen more of a rise of that? And like, what is the... I, I've seen more of a normalization of it, um, even within families, that families are, they'll even call them boosters. That they'll, they'll go and they'll get somebody that will prescribe them the medication. They may even already be on a particular ADHD, and then they'll get somebody to give them an extra one as a booster. I saw an interesting poll about two years ago, which surprised me. But it was a poll of uh, college students in the United States. 
48%, so the question on the poll was, is do you consider the use of ADHD medication a performance enhancing drug violation like it would be in sports? 48% said no, 52% said yes. And so it seems kind of right, split real close down the middle as to what the college population sees that as normal and okay versus a, a performance enhancing drug. And that's what a lot of them do look at it is, you know, it's a booster, it gives me time to get through finals, it gives me motivation, it gives me the energy, it helps me do this. Um, it tends to be, what I see where that, in my anecdotal case history, mostly kiddos that um, are very driven. They are trying to get those straight A's. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're driven. They're driven to do that. And if they feel that they're sliding at all, they're doing whatever they can to kind of get something else going. The, I, my clients, historically with that at the college level, I wouldn't label them as addiction clients. They tend to be a little more of the mental health. Of course, you bring that on board and my, my wheels start spinning. Um, but it tends to be those guys are, are the ones that are doing that typically are not historical addiction clients. The addiction clients typically have already progressed to cocaine or other things like that that are a little bit stronger to get that accomplished. Which one of these do you guys want me to hit on first? Commercialization of weed, um, there's a lot more. The potency, 1970s average level of potency in marijuana in the United States is about 6%. In my office, I have cartridges and casings that show up to 88 to the low 90s percent of THC. So we've gone in the last, I don't know how many years, that it was that 60 years, 50, 60 years, we've gone from 6% almost up to 100% in the ability to consume THC commercially. Uh, when I talk about marijuana, I tell people, look, we are in human uncharted territory with cannabis within our culture on various levels. Some of them, it is super cool uncharted territory. The medicinal benefits of what this plant has potential for is mind-blowing. But you essentially need to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. It's not as simple as what people think. It's not as simple as this sativa is going to do this, this indica is going to do this. They're literally looking at threshold levels of THC shrinking cancer cells. And they're trying to narrow down the window. That's a real thing. Um, you know, and so we're in uncharted territory of what this plant can do for us medicinally, but we're not even close to figuring it out yet. The other uncharted territory, I've seen at least four individuals in my, my practice hospitalized for what I believe psychotic reactions to consumption of high potency marijuana, typically either the edibles or the oils or what used to be BHO or they call shatter or things like that. These individuals, all four of them, history of bipolar disorder and it fired off a manic episode that created psychosis and violence that freaked the family out. So they get them into the hospital, the hospital stabilizes them. Obviously they're not consuming in the hospital about a week goes by, the psychosis disappears or drops. My clients, the once they get out of the hospital, the ones that go back to the high potency, we end up back in the hospital. We end up back with psychotic, with psychotic symptoms. The ones that don't go back to the high potency have not been back to the hospital. So there appears to be some level of risk factor of higher potency and people who are already struggling with mood disorders, the, in my office specifically, what I've seen is the bipolar, and it fires off these manic episodes that is very problematic. I have had a seizure because of eat too much of an edible that I made. Uh, back in the day, I used to be all about trying to figure out how to get more weed in me. I made some cookies, put a lot of weed in them, uh, my brother and I termed them seizure cookies because it literally gave me a seizure. I know, it's kind of, you got to be kind of crazy in your head to be, you know, seizure cookies. I wouldn't eat them, but my brother would. He ate them. He didn't have a seizure, but he basically blacked out and couldn't move physically for about 16 hours. It was really weird, right? So in higher dosages, we're starting to see some of these things. And when that happened, 
I never, I would, t when I was running groups, I'd tell the kiddos this, and, and when, when the kiddos get to know me, they know I don't run scare tactics, but a lot of them are like, yeah, I don't think so, man. How do you know it was the weed? Maybe it was something else. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure it was the weed, but whatever. And then, and then about a year later, so back in the day, most of the research on marijuana was coming out of the UK, and, and specifically in London, and I came across an article that shows high potency marijuana can fire off seizures in certain individuals. So I marched that thing into my group, like here you go. Which is really fascinating because we're using the substance to reduce seizures, right? And kiddos and things like that. Again, uncharted territory and we're trying to figure this stuff out. The potency is up there. Most of the marijuana, the flower or the buds that are smoked or consumed by my clients are typically in the mid-20s to the low 30s of potency as to what they're smoking. And again, if you compare that to the weed of the 70s, that's a pretty significant increase. And so we're seeing different, um, different emotional and behavioral stuff that comes along with that. I, if you guys are interested, you should look up uh, the Netherlands and Amsterdam as to what they're doing about their marijuana culture. Um, they're no longer tolerating the cafes. They're shutting it down. Uh, the information I, I've come across or, or have been given is that they're a socialist healthcare system. They believe they're hemorrhaging billions and billions of dollars treating mental health issues in their middle-aged population that they think could have been prevented if they didn't give them, if they didn't have access to that weed. They're, as a society, they really think that adolescent use of high-potency marijuana is severely increasing the mental health distress within their middle-aged population or causing um, some pretty significant mental health stuff, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, um, and things like that. And so we are looking at those possible impacts. Impacts on relationships is kind of the standard, the usual. You know, you distance yourself. It's the people that either are going to tolerate it or not tolerate it. One of the things that I found, um, and it was an unsus... I, I had no idea that this was what was going on with me. When I quit smoking... Um, I, I started to quit smoking about the time my son was born, about 18, 19 years ago, when I started to think, I, gotta, I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, one of the things I found, which really surprised me, is when I wasn't smoking, I cared about people more. I really did. You know, I was thinking, well, no, weed makes me mellow, and I like people, and all that. No. no well, it's some of that, but not nearly to the same extent. When I stopped smoking, I actually had more empathy. I cared more about the people around me. I felt more connected and I felt bonded better and quicker and easier. Um, and I tell this to the kiddos and they're like, yeah, whatever. Because uh, they don't really buy into that. Or they don't really believe that. Um, but I b do believe that ability to connect is significantly compromised with all substances. But for myself in particular, marijuana did a lot of that for me as well. Um, Developmental concerns, the usual, the standard, we're all about telling people brain development, the younger you put it in you, the bigger the chances the problems are gonna be, that's real. I basically describe it as much like we've been telling mothers for years, if you drink during pregnancy, that's gonna be a problem, or it could be, because basically you're creating new cells, you damage a particular cell with alcohol, anything coming out after that could be compromised. The brain during adolescence is in its second, its final, and its most aggressive developmental period of a lifetime. So if you're putting stuff in there, the same theory holds true. It detaches and it goes in. What is developing through that and out of that could be compromised. That's how I describe it to the kiddos. Um, chronic versus episodic. I'm seeing much less episodic marijuana use and more chronic. I don't know if you guys, I'm going to steal an Eric Martin line. I don't know if anybody knows Eric Martin. He's one of the, the heads of ACBO. Years ago, I was watching, he was doing, he was, I was at one of his presentations for weed, and he's like, yeah, you know, you don't, you don't usually hear about, he basically says, you know, the more potent the substance, the more consistent and regular use we have in human beings, right? So is, there's episodic drinkers. There's people that don't drink very much. They might, they might, they might have a drink on their birthday. They might have a drink on, on New Year's or at a wedding, right? You don't really hear about, you know, when you're talking to somebody who's doing methamphetamine or cocaine, yeah, I only do tweak on my birthday. 
just, just at weddings, right? You know, so the more potent the substance, the more consistent use we see. With the potency of marijuana climbing, the episodic use is dropping. So people who are smoking are getting quicker to regular and consistent use. I am seeing much less episodic marijuana use in my entire client population. Even, and I watch it move quicker. So when they start smoking, I'm immediately thinking, how quickly is this going to get regular, and what the heck can I do to slow that down or change that process? I'm just thinking when you say that, so is it the potency is creating a stronger addiction, like with the brain, like the chemicals that are being released with that high potency, and then the come down, or, you know, is that? I think, it's, I think it's both. I think it is the neurological impacts in the brain. Um, the simplest explanation of the brain stuff is um, addiction goes in and it sits next to, the, to our three core drives that keep us um, humans, our food drive, our sleep drive, and our sex drive. Addiction goes and sits right next to that. And so the more potent, I think it probably speeds that process up. And then there's also a learned response. Wow, that worked. Wow, that worked really well. I want to do that more or, or otherwise. So I think it's a little bit of the combination of the both, probably with a little more influence on the potency of it. It's activating and causing those things to move a little bit quicker. Um, but that, that's a good question. Uh, nicotine's extremely addictive, but that's not necessarily because of potency. The way that it's described best is most drugs hit the brain like a single sword. It's got two edges. Nicotine's got three. So neurochemically, nicotine gets into the brain and responds differently. That's why you'll hear a lot of people say it's harder to quit nicotine than it is harder to quit heroin. Um, and so some of it's neurochemical stuff, too. I know at least three kids who are chronic users and say that they can't get out of bed in the morning unless they smoke because they're so nauseous. Yeah. They didn't have the nausea before they became chronic users, but now they have to have the weed to yeah. get rid of the nausea, but they get nauseous with Yeah. Them. 1993, in the 90s, we were starting to map out the human genome and started to have a, an explosion in our ability to look at the brain from a scientific point of view. In 1993, this is the definition as to why marijuana is labeled as addictive. They identified a neurotransmitter they hadn't ever found before, and they named it anandamide. It's an old Sanskrit word for bliss. The brain thinks THC is anandamide. Anandamide does several things. Increases blood flow to your eyes. Duh. Regulates appetite. Munchies. Um, we know that anandamide and marijuana historically has been used, well, marijuana has been used to reduce nausea in cancer patients because of the cocktail of medications. So my theory would be that those individuals, the brain has gone in, has done down regulation on the anandamide sites. So the brain stopped making anandamide because it thinks it's got a bunch in there. And the brain is an organ of homeostasis. So it's like, we're cool. We got this. We got as much. Well, we got even more than we need. So it starts to shut it down. And then if there isn't THC that's active or running on that and they sleep and some of that stuff's burning off or burning out, I have to imagine that that interplay is something that's playing along with the nausea in the morning. And they're probably not eating very well. They may be hitting some munchies here and there, but they're, you know, they're regular appetite and things. And so that would also probably be compromising some of the nausea stuff. But that's, that would be kind of my, my best guess as to scientifically why that would be happening. Um, because they've built that up so much that it's not there to do what it needs to. Um, Medicinal versus intoxication, that's how I'm approaching this stuff at this point. When I'm having conversations with people who are claiming that they're using it as medicinal, um, there is some reality to that. Some of my PTSD clients, very, very, very common symptom of PTSD is nightmares. Nightmares and sleep problems. Many of my clients are taking low-level THC, high CBD edibles, about an hour before going to bed to try to help them go to sleep and to shut down the nightmares. And many of them are reporting that it's effective. 
50%, I'd say, about 50% are individuals that I got to keep an eye on of, are we doing this for intoxication or are we doing this for medication? About other 50%, they're not using marijuana at any other point in their day. They're not abusing any other substances, but they are using that to try to manage or to cope with some of their PTSD symptoms. Um, the, it's, it's, it's an interesting debate that's changed a little bit with the legalization because people are having a harder time using just the medical use as a justification for weed being okay. Now they've got to have a little bit of a deeper conversation that it's legal or otherwise, you know, is this, is this medicine or is this wreck? You know, what, what are we doing here? And so that is kind of a neat part of the legalization is it has changed the conversation to a deeper level. Um, that conversation within families has been fascinating to watch. Um, been working with some families and parents are like, no, 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 no. Take everything out of the room. The kid's grounded for six years through high school. I caught him smoking weed. We're not doing this. And now they're like, whatever. Whatever. It's legal. And they're pulling their own smoke out. Or they're talking about it and there, a lot of other people are exposing that they're they're smoking as well, which is causing some conflicting thoughts and feelings within the next population, uh, you know, the next generation. What is this? What is it medical? Is it not? My brother's been calling his medicine medicine to his child for the last, you know, 14 years. Um, my brother's not using it as medicine. He's using it as intoxication. But And now, you know, when his, son, his son's getting older, my, my nephew's uh, 16, you know, as he starts to grow, I'm sure that my nephew's going to start to tease that out. No, Dad, that's not medicine. You're just getting high. You know, what is this? So it, is, it, it, is, it has been very interesting and very fascinating. And like I said, the legalization of it um, has some really good benefits in the sense that it is opening up the opportunity for us to understand the medicine a little bit differently or the plant differently and to study it and research it. And it is changing the dialogue a little bit. Most families are dropping back into the conversations and, and just basically putting it right next to alcohol. You know, however they're approaching their family culture associated with what the values are that they're teaching their kiddos around alcohol, they're now sliding, most families are sliding marijuana into that same kind of category. Um, and so that's, that's generally what I see. In families that used to have it up here, I've now dropped it down to the alcohol level. Um, any, any other, yeah? I was um, curious if you've heard any difference between high CBD, low THC, or like the difference between THC and CBD, because um, I hear a lot about CBD being really healthy, like, and, you know, THC is the, you know, a lot of people using high CBD for like body pain, things like that, Yeah. Um, using it pretty regular. Um, the, I don't believe what people say. <laughs> Most of the time, I do. Uh, there and this is where when the the education and the research that I've looked at explains it at such a more complicated level than just CB. So, for instance, del THC, delta nine. There's eight other deltas in just the THC cannabinoid. The THC cannabinoid is one of 49 cannabinoids. How many other cannabinoids do we know and other delta levels and what could they be doing or not doing? Um, the CBD stuff, in my, my, my humble opinion, and it's just an opinion, seems to be a little more of a marketing in the commercialization of bringing in medical clients. Um, and, it, it's in our, and again, we're, we're researching, we're trying to figure out what does CBD do? What does THC do? the different levels, what are the different benefits and things like that. But anecdotally, most of the clients that are saying high CBDs, it is a pain issue. Uh, and oftentimes a salve or, or topicals or things like that that they're using. And I get about a 50, 50 uh, percent as to when clients are saying it's helpful or it's not helpful. Um, the anxiety stuff, what we tend to see, again, really low THC. Um, and then some level of CBD appears to be have some medicinal properties that help people in different areas. Um, but that's a good question. I, I, I'm real skeptical about all of that stuff, again, just because 
what people are saying, they're, they're simplifying it way too much. And so I'm just waiting to hear more and more research. What do we know about this? Who's moving forward with this? Um, and what are, what are we figuring out? Um, but that's yeah, a good question. Um, and I do, I am looking for, you know, there's CBG. There, there, I mean, there's, there's so many others in there. And what are, we, what are we doing about them? And since that, none of that's in the dispensaries, you know, they're not really broadcasting. It, it, so that's why I'm thinking a fair amount of that may be part of that commercialization. And how do we get money into our pockets? So let's market to this stuff to the medical community who are uninformed but are going to believe stuff because it's either so prevalent out there or otherwise. So. It's a good question. Um, do you believe that marijuana is a gateway drug? The gateway theory is misunderstood. Um, most people think the gateway theory is that if you use this substance, it's going to move you to this one. That's not what the gateway theory is. Um, the answer to your question is yes, marijuana is absolutely a gateway drug because the gateway theory is this. People who have gotten to heroin have passed through these gateways. And so, yeah, marijuana, I do believe, is absolutely a gateway that people who end up at the higher level substances pass through. Just about anybody who does heroin or methamphetamine or cocaine has smoked nicotine at some point in their life or are a smoker. Nicotine was a gateway that they passed through before they got to that other location. Marijuana is at the front end. And so, yeah, from the theory point of view, yes. Now, to go with the concept of do you does one particular substance use propel you or move you to the next substance? Absolutely, I believe so. And I think that's a learned behavior. If I smoke something and it makes me feel good, I am more likely to smoke something else to feel good. If I drink something and it feels good, or I put something in my body and it makes me feel good, or even better yet, it reduces a negative and gives me a positive. That's the strongest human learning behavior connection you can make. If I learn that to do in a particular way or with a particular substance, I am more likely to do that with something else. And so some of that, that concept of does one use propel you to the next, I think that's more of a behavioral and a learned conditioned response. Um, so does that make sense? Did you? Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry you lost your kiddo. The, I respect that. <laughs> That my, my heroin addicts all tell me the same thing, you know, and, and I, I'll, I'll ask them, and it's like, you know, what, what do I need to tell the kiddos so they don't end up where you end up? And they tell me, just tell them not to do it. <laughs> and it makes me laugh my ass off. Cause, and we all start laughing, and we look at it, and I said, how many times did I tell you that? At least like 100. But it doesn't work, right? You know, it, but yeah, they, they'll start at the beginning and then it, it will progress and move forward. And, and marijuana is a, a very accessible. It is lower level. It gets people comfortable with consuming things. And then they are very much at, at a risk for continuing on. I smoked a lot of weed and drank a lot of alcohol. I didn't become uh, dependent upon some of the higher end stuff. I don't know if some of that was wisdom or just different personality. I like depressants, I don't like stimulants. My brother likes stimulants, um, which uh, I'm glad I didn't get to heroin because I think that just scares me. And I'm glad that the opiate medications didn't exist back in my day when I was using because I think I would have been at bigger risk for that. Um, okay, so we need to wrap up, don't we? All right, I'm taking up too much of your guys' time. I think that's it too. Okay. Yeah, that's it. All right, thank you. Thanks for being here, you guys.